Welcome, welcome everyone. It's the Texas Values Radio Show on this beautiful summer day. Uh, we're happy you're joining us here today. I'm Jonathan Covey. I'm the Policy Director for Texas Values, filling in for Jonathan Signs on the Texas Values Report this week. He's in Milwaukee, rubbing shoulders with the greats. And so we have a very special guest uh, we're going to have to visit with you today. But before we get to him, just as a reminder, you can catch us every day on uh, every day on this station, KTXW 1120 The Bridge, or you can watch us on demand on iHeartRadio, uh, Facebook, Spotify, YouTube, all of your favorite live streaming platforms. Also, if you want to find out more about anything that we've talked about, you can find tons of great information on our website at TXValues. Dot org and you can stay up on breaking news and information by texting our text alerts at TX values to 797979. That's my spiel. Our guest today is Dr. Lior Sapir, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He holds a PhD in political science from Boston College and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Program on Constitutional Government at Harvard University. Since joining um, Manhattan Institute, Dr. Spear has become a widely recognized thought leader on topics related to pediatric gender medicine, education policy, and culture. Dr. Spear, Lior, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You know, there's a, uh, you know, we're obviously very excited to have you. There's a lot to unpack here, um, and we want to hear sort of your analysis on one of the more, you know, egregious, uh, I would say, trans policies that California has passed, but um, for, for our supporters and listeners, would you just give us, you know, just give us a little bit of background first on yourself and um, some of the work that you've done in the past. I've seen, I've seen amicus briefs, I've seen policy documents, you've been quite active in this sphere of uh, gender policy. Sure. Uh, my work focuses on what could probably be called the capture of the medical field and the mental health fields. Um, and by extension, also the education fields, because they rely on the medical and mental health fields on issues related to transgender identity, gender dysphoria, um, and policies in the medical and educational world that are intended to help children, but more often than not harm them. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, and I've seen your work, uh, you've done, you've done quite a bit of work across the board on this. Um, so California's new law, um, you know, what does it say? And and is it is it accurate to to say that California uh basically shut down parental rights, the parental rights movement um in the education arena here? Well, it certainly tried to do that. Time will tell if it succeeded. I highly doubt it. Uh if there's one thing that it's that is going to be very difficult for the Newsom administration to be able to do is to shut down the concerns of parents about their own children. But uh, AB 1955, which was passed into law last week, um, effectively uh, forbids parents from organizing in order to compel their schools to disclose uh, to, uh, to them when their own children uh, desire to be referred to as members of the opposite sex. And you know the, this is part of ongoing battles all across the country um, in many, many school districts, in red and blue states alike, where schools are performing what we've been calling secret gender transition. And that refers to the way in which uh, schools will refer to students with uh, names and pronouns that uh, belong to the opposite sex, and conceal this information from parents. And we can get into exactly why they do that, the arguments that they make. But the bottom line is that this is a dangerous practice. And it's a practice that has come under criticism by health authorities in a growing number of countries, most recently the UK, um, as not being evidence-based, as being against the best interests and welfare of children and families. Um, and uh, Democrats in the United States are deferring by and large to advocacy organizations, transgender advocacy organizations. They're ignoring or dismissing the science on this issue um, and, and pushing forward full steam ahead uh, while ignoring the rights of parents to direct the upbringing of their own children. Uh, I saw um, Abigail Schreier came out with a piece in the free press yesterday talking about this idea of how schools have a sort of a gender support plan 
um, and basically, you know, in, including telling everyone except the parents. And so I guess, you know, if, if everyone in the school knows about this except for the parents, how how is that not outing a student and how how is that not um, uh, violating parental rights? That's right. So schools make the argument that uh, that that they have to do this in the interest of protecting the privacy and by extension, the safety of students. The assumption, of course, being that unless a student explicitly says my parents are safe and you can give them this information, the school has to presume that the parents will uh, use the information to abuse their child, um, which is just uh, it's, it's absurd. You know, are there cases like that? Of course there are. But uh, we already have laws and policies on the books to deal with cases like that. This is something new. This is a case in which uh, activists and uh, school districts um, are defining the word abuse to include parents who refuse to affirm, meaning uh, go along with their child's alternative gender identity. So, um, so you have a situation in which a child basically leads a double life. They have one life at school and one life at home, and the school goes out of its way oftentimes to conceal this information from parents. And one of the things that um, that's done in places like California is that schools um, have parallel records where they have the official records to which uh, parents have a right uh, to, um, and there they they you know they retain the correct information about the child. And then they have a separate set of unofficial records where they wow. record the child's gender identity um, and how the child uh, wishes to present at school and wishes to be treated and the bathrooms they want to use, the sports teams they want to play on. Um, some of this stuff puts kids directly in danger. You know, if you have a 14 year old girl using the boy's bathroom, um, you know, that is a situation that exposes that 14 year old girl to uh, to high risk. Um, and it's something that any parent would want to know. Um, but schools are not disclosing that information on the assumption that parents are generally unsafe unless a student tells them otherwise. Um, we've also seen cases in which schools provide students with binders and tuckers. If you know what these are, these are garments that are meant to compress, um, in the case of teenage girls, meant to compress their breasts in the case of uh, young boys to compress their genitals so that they don't appear to be members of their own sex. These types of garments are known to have um, health risks associated. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, breast binding that is associated with um, a higher risk of, of uh, rib cage fracture, um, it can lead to severe and chronic pain. Um, th these are not only psychological interventions which can lock, it, lock in a child's temporary confusion or distress and make medical interventions more uh, likely. Um, but these are also physical interventions. Um, and we also see that there are school districts around the country, um, specifically in, in blue states like Washington, that are now inviting health clinics that actually administer hormonal treatments uh, onto campus where kids can get so-called gender affirming care on campus. So this is an extremely troubling development um, in, in the education uh, field and education policy. Um, and it's my hope that you know parents start to understand what's going on in their own school districts and start getting organized. And unfortunately, laws like this are meant to quash parental organization, but that just means that parents are gonna take their concerns uh, to the legislative level, I hope. Right, yeah, that would be the hope. Well, you know, you hear a lot about how you know, one of the reasons given for withholding from parents is that um, they're afraid that, you know, the parents are obviously homophobic, but also that the kids might end up getting <laughs> kicked out of the home or something, something to that effect. But I mean, this is, I mean, this is California. Have you ever met anyone who, uh, this is, I mean, a real danger. I, I think that it, se it seems like this is sort of a made up excuse um, on most well, levels. I, yeah. I mean, look, I, I think, it's it's one of these situations where if you dig deep enough, there's always a kernel of truth that's been right. highly exaggerated and inflated to create a fundamentally unsound and unsafe policy. And the kernel of truth here is important to acknowledge, and that is that, yes, there are cases historically, you know, at present of kids who 
Um, you know, historically, it's been kids who said to their parents, you came out as gay or lesbian and suffered abuse on that account. That ha that has happened. There's no denying it. Um, the problem is that uh, gender dysphoria or transgender identity is fundamentally different from um, homosexuality. And of course, transgender activists have been at pains to make their claims piggyback on, um, on the gay rights movement because they know that the gay rights movement has a wide acceptance among Americans. Um, especially young Americans. Um, and so they say, you know, what we're saying is the same thing that what gay rights advocates were saying a generation ago. But of course it's not. And the reason it's not is because, um, you know, a transgender identity, gender dysphoria, these are known to be uh, uh, maladaptive coping mechanisms for underlying psychological problems, ongoing right. mental health and neurocognitive challenges, history of trauma and abuse, um, you know, autism, there's a very high rate of autism uh, among those who identify as the opposite sex. So more often than not, when the child says, I'm trans, you know, that's a symptom of some kind of psychological struggle. And parents need to know about that struggle. If they don't know about it, it's probably going to get worse. Right. And obviously, when one of the big uh, problems is, as well is that all of this is not founded on uh, accurate science. It's uh, it's founded on, you know, sort of made up science by WPATH and and other um, other organizations. And of course, Governor Newsom, ever the obscure of facts, uh, declared at one point recently, um, he said, under California law, minors cannot legally change their name or gender without parental consent. Um, and my question is, how can he say that? Because I mean, it's, especially with this sort of this law in place. You know, I'm, I guess he's going very high on the on the word legally. The he may be technically correct that that the official documents, as you were talking about earlier, the official document, a name change can't happen, or a, a gender change can't happen. But but behind the scenes, in practicality, it's really happening. That's correct. That's correct. So even if legally they need the consent of their parents, for all intents and purposes in their everyday lives, they are being treated as members of the opposite sex. Now, you know, it's important to understand social transition is not something that kids do. It's something that's done to them because a child can, can do nothing more than ask adults um, or peers to refer to them as, you know, with a different name or different pronouns. Um, but it's up to the other people to do so or not. And so a social transition hasn't occurred until uh, a, a critical mass of other people uh, refer to that child with their desired names and pronouns. So social transition is something that is done to them. And it's true that legally these uh, these kids need their, the consent of their parents to change their name. But again, for all intents and purposes, they have, they're being socially transitioned behind the parents' back. I did want to say one thing about, you mentioned evidence. Um, there has it, there has only been one systematic review of evidence for mental health outcomes associated with social transition in children and adolescents. And that systematic review was published uh, alongside the famous uh, CAST review in the UK in April. Um, and it looked at all the underlying research on mental health outcomes from social transition. And it, what it found was that, no, in fact, we don't have any, any credible evidence that social transition is either helpful or harmful. Um, however, we do have quite a bit of evidence reaching back four to five decades that shows that um, when you socially transition children in particular, when you uh, perform full social transition on them, their uh, identity confusion is far more likely to persist. Whereas if you don't socially transition them, they're far more likely to desist, meaning come to terms with their body and their sex. And if the kids are more likely to persist, that also means that they're far more likely to uh, want to undergo medical interventions. And that's why the CAST review emphasizes that social transition in school is not just a neutral act of respect or inclusivity, which is how kind of you know advocates of these policies in the United States frame them. It's an, uh, as Dr. Cass calls it, it's an active psychological intervention and it has the potential to do real harm. And so at minimum, and this is what we've been arguing in our amicus briefs and some of the lawsuits involving so secret gender transition, at minimum, parents have to be involved in these decisions. Right. Yeah, it's it's not a neutral act. It's definitely a full war sort of uh, indoctrination that's moving in the wrong direction. So 
I'm glad to see you're involved in that arena. And, you know, and, and you were you were also instrumental here in Texas, sort of helping out uh, our organization as well as um, Texas Public Policy Foundation in leading the charge on getting SB 14, the, um, the gender modification ban here in Texas, passed. Um, and of course, one of the reasons why we keep, you know, we keep talking about this issue, even though in Texas we do have, we do have a level of protection, is that you know our our work is never done here. We have to continue fighting on this issue. We have to continue sort of being a standard bearer for other states as well. Um, and, you know, so, you know, certainly we'll, we'll want to continue working with you and continue, you know, seeing sort of the work that's going on in other states, but, uh, California is just such a flagship of going in the wrong direction, um, that it's, it's really, um, it, it instructive to be able to sort of see what's going on there. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Leo Sapir, a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. We have a number of crucial fights, folks. Um, to win and your donations help us stay in the fight. So if you find value in the work that we do, you would go to txvalues.org and drop off a donation. Um, that just helps us keep quality folks um, in our staff to represent your values, uh, keep bad books out of the out of uh, public school libraries, push back against the Biden administration. Um, so, Lior, you know, I, I got one more question for you, sort of uh, down the road of the medical organizations. You've done sort of a, you've done a lot of work looking at these medical organizations, American Academy of Pediatrics, Endocrine Society, others, um, all organizations that are relied on by transgender advocates to, you know, add so-called so -called scientific legitimacy to their to their claims. And it turns out that none of these organizations, as you were talking about, really had done any kind of systematic uh, review. They just cherry pick information. Um, but how is this sort of, get, talk a little bit more about that and tell me how, sort of how this has developed a little bit, uh, because it seems like all the major medical organizations have have jumped on board with this. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And of course, a lot of the uh, stuff that we're seeing in the education field is downstream of what's happening in the medical field, because, you know, these uh, school uh, gender transition advocates say, oh, but this is a necessary me medical or mental health intervention. So look, um, you know, we don't we don't really have the time to dive deeply into this. But I think what I can say here is uh, U.S. medical associations, uh, three of them in particular, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and um, the Endocrine Society have been fundamentally misleading the public and even their own members about the evidence base for these uh, treatments, for hormonal and surgical treatments, um, uh, and about their effects, um, about the uh, rates of regret and detransition. Um, we have been, you know, banging on this drum for several years now. We've been trying to expose the shoddy um, pseudoscience behind uh, these recommendations. We've been showing that the evidence, the studies that they cite don't say what they claim to, to show. Um, but it's only in the last few months that uh, finally we have some, um, some major events in this area um, that have made it impossible for people who don't already uh, agree that, some, that there's a problem um, right. to continue turning turning their head away. Um, and maybe the most important um, of, the, of these developments was the disclosure of private uh, internal communications within the World Professional Association for Transgender Health that were disclosed as part of the Alabama lawsuit over that state's age restriction law. And what those documents show is that WPATH consciously and deliberately suppressed evidence that was inconvenient for its position, that uh, access to these treatments should be widely available for kids. Um, and then it lied to the public, uh, saying that, you know, that in fact, uh, a review, a, a systematic review of the evidence was not possible. It knew that it was possible. It had the review and suppressed it. Um, and so, you know, this is going to have massive cascade effects beyond the lawsuit. So we've already seen the Biden administration within weeks of this news coming out has now distanced itself from surgeries and said we don't we no longer support gender surgeries on children. Right. Um, so things are going to get better, um, but it's going to take more, more time. Well, we're going to keep working on that, obviously, and I know you will as well. I want to thank you for your time with us today. Uh, always good to see you, my friend. We're talking with uh, Dr. Leo Spear, fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Thank you so much for being on with us.
Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we we do appreciate Leo's time, and it's just such a um, appropriate uh, and relevant discussion to to talk about at this uh, juncture, especially since we're seeing this as he was speaking with uh, you know talking on a national scale about this. We heard this prominently featured in speeches from the RNC, uh, including from Donald Trump, his son Donald Jr. Um, and here in Texas, of course, as we talked about, Texas has worked hard, uh, Texas values has worked hard on this issue uh, to help pass comprehensive protections against these types of gender interventions. So uh, we're thankful for the work that's being done by organizations uh, like Lior's, and we're going to continue to work on this. In other news, seven states have come together to fight a new rule that could force doctors into performing gender transition procedures. Um, the HHS put out this rule and the Biden administration made it clear that it wants so-called, you know, gender affirming care available to all young children. And this rule came out in April and the changes, what they do is they expand the rules definition of sex discrimination to include discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. In some states like Texas and Tennessee, this rule has already been blocked by federal courts, but there are a number of states that it hasn't. And in Missouri, Utah, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Idaho, and Arkansas, they filed a, uh, a lawsuit to try to get this stopped the same way Texas has done. And Alliance Defending Freedom is actually representing them in that lawsuit. So we're going to continue um, thinking about them, praying for them, and helping them with um, anything we can. You know, I, I, I kind of want to leave you guys on this note. Um, and, and that is that, you know, America is great because America is good. And what I mean by that is if America ceases to be good, um, she, she's no longer going to be great. And th those were those were words that were attributed to Alexis de Tocqueville. Um, and, and they cut right to the core of what makes America great. And that is that is um, having God and 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 having God in government, because, you know, today, too many Americans reject the idea of God. They reject the idea that America is, um, you know, under God. Um, but I, I think, you know, we've seen with, with sort of with the Texas, with the uh, Supreme Court, you know, part of the problem in the past had been that the Supreme Court had banned prayer in public schools. They banned the Bible from schools. They even banned the displays of Ten Commandments in governmental um, places on governmental grounds. And they somehow distorted the Establishment Clause and had sort of a non-historical view uh, or interpretation of it that I, I would say could not be squared with the practices of our founding fathers' uh, generation, who we saw regularly gave thanks for the blessings of God. But I think there's hope. You know, the Supreme Court in recent years has overturned many, if not all, of the uh, the problematic precedents that they had uh, passed in, the, in on the Establishment Clause. And, you know, there were many Americans who were, they were rightly outraged uh, that, uh, for example, Jack Phillips, the Colorado cake baker, um, spent nearly a decade in litigation merely for living his life in accordance with his religious views. So, you know, more Americans are also recognizing this. It's not discriminatory to talk about basic biological differences between men and women. And then it's it's morally wrong to treat people differently based on their race, such as we're seeing in all these um, sort of DEI movements from DEI advocates. Um, so, so I guess the bottom line is, you know, we need to understand that the laws and the systems of government that we have reflect the values of the people. Um, as John Adams famously wrote to his wife, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Without God, there can be no goodness. And without goodness, there can be no greatness, at least, at least none worth having. Uh, so as we go on about our day, let's, let's pray for God to guide and restore our nation through a return to him. Um, you know, without that, little else matters. And we are coming to the end of our show, but don't forget our seventh annual 
Texas Faith, Family, and Freedom Forum. Uh, this is going to go on September 13th through 14th of this year at Great Hills Baptist Church in Austin, Texas. Um, and we're going to have a number of amazing speakers, including uh, Coach Joe Kennedy, uh, one of the ones that sort of helped win back that that uh, lemon test, that religious free exercise test at the Supreme Court. Uh, Representative Tom Oliverson, Senator Bob Hall, Dr. Etan Heim, um, Mary Margaret Olihan. We we spoke with Macy Petty a couple of weeks ago. She's going to be there, the athlete, NCAA athlete. So it's going to be a great time. You want to get tickets uh, as soon as you can. Uh, we also have, let me take a look here at my uh, list. We have a couple of uh, press releases fixing to go out, so you can sort of keep an eye on that. Um, also, we have a petition at txvalues.org to return uh, sex ed opt-in to our state statutes. This is to protect kids from having to uh, be in uh, sex ed education classes in the public schools. So uh, we want to thank our faithful listeners and our supporters for listening to this show and say that if you find value in the work that we're doing, you can make a donation by going to our website at txvalues.org. Remember, government belongs to those who show up, and our team will always show up for you because we are dedicated to being your voice in the government and your boots on the ground for conservative social issues. So I'm Jonathan Covey, inviting you back here next time as we continue to lay down a vision for the next social conservative generation. Thanks for joining us.